Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Aramburu, and I'm here to talk to you today about a new way of thinking about carbon and climate change. So, when I mention climate change, you know, a number of things may have come to your mind. Maybe uh, you thought about the bad things that will happen from climate change, you know, sea level rise, maybe you got alarmed by that, or <clears throat> maybe uh, you thought, wow, this is such a big problem, you know, how do we solve it? Or maybe you just felt guilty, you know, maybe you drove here, felt guilty about the carbon emissions. Well, I have a theory that humans don't really solve big problems by alarmism. They don't really solve big problems by feeling guilty. Uh, we solve problems that are huge by breaking them down into actionable steps. And then suddenly, this big problem kind of becomes an opportunity. So, <coughs> um, when I was in college, I thought I had found kind of the solution of how to do this. Um, I was studying at Princeton, and my advisor came out with this terrible graph. It's a big paper, and this is the only graph in my presentation, so don't worry. Um, but my advisor at Princeton, I was studying ecology and environmental science, and he thought, as I did, that the best way to break down the climate problem was to create actionable items. So he said, well, we emit 8 billion tons of CO2 every year. If we broke that down into eight wedges, eight pieces of the pie, were there technologies that existed today that could let us get back to where we were before the Industrial Revolution? And so he put together this great plan. He said, we use a combination of things like renewable energy, build big solar fields, big, big wind farms. Uh, we'd use other fuel sources and sources of energy, nuclear, natural gas, carbon capture. Change what we fuel our cars, even do biomass energy. Also, change how we farm, conserve our rainforests. And then the last piece of the pie was something that the everyday person could actually do. Efficiency. Use less energy, drive half the distance you normally do. Well, this seemed great, except 10 years later, almost none of this has been accomplished in any meaningful capacity. And I think the reason is that seven out of eight of these wedges are things that we, as regular people, really have no control over. You know, we can't force the government to build a wind farm. We can't change how we fuel our cars. The only thing we can do is kind of inconvenience ourselves. <laughs> and I don't think that's really going to fly, and that's not going to solve anything. So it got me thinking, you know, if we want to go from being carbon positive to carbon negative, we really need to make it an opportunity. And so I'm going to present to you here three what I call actionable steps. These are three wedges that aren't listed on that graph. Things that anyone can do to become carbon negative. And when I say anyone, I mean could be me, it could be you, it could be a farmer living in Africa. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is called biochar. And biochar, you may have heard of, it's charcoal. It's charcoal made from agricultural or crop waste. Biochar is charcoal that's made at very high temperatures in low oxygen, using a process called pyrolysis. So that means literally to break apart with fire. So we burn waste at very high temperature and we end up with charcoal. But we don't use the charcoal as fuel. It's actually a very potent soil amendment. And it's carbon negative because we're taking waste that normally just gets decomposed or burned or allowed to rot, and we're turning it into a mineral, something that will stay in the earth forever. So biochar was actually developed around 3,000 years ago by Indian farmers living in the Amazon, native farmers, who realized that if they took the remnants of their fire and put it on their crops, their crops grew better. What they didn't know was 3,000 years later, all the carbon that they put in the ground is still there. You can quite literally go to these places in Brazil 
where they've practiced it, and the ground is black. It's full of biochar. And it's about five times as fertile as the surrounding area. And so biochar, in the last 10 years, has really gotten climate scientists thinking, you know, could this be a long-term way to fight climate change? Well, there was a paper in Nature Communications, one of the top scientific journals in the world, that said, yes, it can. Biochar can actually offset about 12% of our annual CO2 emissions. So that's around two of those wedges that I mentioned before. So how do we make biochar? Well, we start with waste. We can make it from anything like sugarcane waste, even human waste, we can make biochar. Anything that's normally just disposed of. We take the biochar, and we put it in our soil. It can be used, in this case, in urban gardening setups. It can also be used in the field. So this is a picture from western Kenya, a field where they're growing crops in biochar. And uh, those people are about as tall as I am. And you can see that that's some pretty huge corn behind them. So uh, a couple, about a year and a half ago, I decided that uh, I wanted to make biochar happen. And so I put together a team of people, and we sought out who was the ideal first customer for this. You know, who could really benefit from this kind of technology? And uh, we found it in an unlikely place, Western Kenya. We put together a crew and went to Kenya and started trying to get biochar, quite literally, in the ground. And uh, we found that it really works. So here, you can see a test plot that's grown with biochar. It outperforms local crops by uh, local test plots, local plots by about uh, 24%. This is the device that we developed to create the biochar in the field at low cost. It's called a biochar kiln. It's made from a recycled oil drum. So things that are available everywhere. You know, we wanted to make this something that anyone in the world could do. Uh, this device costs about $30 to $40 to produce. And uh, we can resell it at a profit. A farmer can use it, and then he can make a profit too. The kiln works, like I said, by burning the biomass at a very high temperature, but with low oxygen. So instead of just getting ashes at the end, we get carbon. We get pure char that we can put in the ground. It's very easy and very scalable to do in Western Kenya. It fits with the local feedstock, what's available, and it's really low cost. And doing this, we've actually created a whole economy around biochar in Western Kenya. People are realizing the benefits, they're understanding that it works, and every pound of biochar they put in the ground, that's about three pounds of CO2 that they're actually taking out of the atmosphere. So if we can get millions and millions of people to do this, you know, we can really get one of those wedges literally in the ground. And you know, we don't think biochar is just for the developing world. So my team, we've actually started marketing biochar products for farmers and gardeners here in the US, because we believe that developed world farmers should have access to this kind of technology too. So in the future, you'll be able to buy these products, grow your food carbon negatively, and maybe you'll even be able to buy products that were grown in biochar. You know, think about that. You buy a tomato, and you know that all the emissions that went into producing it have been offset. It's actually a carbon-negative tomato. So the next thing, next segue, the other next thing I want to talk to you about is growing food. Again, you know, this is kind of an old technology, but it has real applications today. <laughs> we, by growing more food, I think we can actually knock out one of those wedges that I mentioned before. Now, the first thing you're saying is, I don't have time to grow food. You know, I work, I'm not into gardening. Well, again, there's new technologies on the rise that can actually solve this. So, this is called the grower bot. And uh, this is a technology that my team is developing. It's an automated gardening system. So, uh, this technology will actually grow your own food for you. You know, you're already paying a lot 
to heat and cool your home, why not use some of that space to grow food? And why not use the power of technology to make it really, really easy? So the grower bot, it actually has sensors built in that ensure the optimal mix of nutrients, water, and light to grow whatever crop you want to. So you pick the crop, grower bot does everything, you get the food. And we also try to make it fun. So there's a social aspect. You can actually connect your grower bot up to your Facebook account. So this is like, this is like Farmville in real life. <laughs> so, so that's how we can grow more food. And you know, maybe, maybe grower bot's not right for you, but maybe when you make choices about where your food comes from, you pick local. You know, agriculture is actually about 8% of global CO2 emissions. And it's not just the cultivation, it's the transportation, too. So the last idea that I want to talk to you about is uh, it's not quite so obvious. Again, it's old. And it's something that I didn't realize was important and was really a way to offset carbon until I got down the road of this whole journey. So that's making things. Uh, if you think about where your products come from, it's mind-boggling. You know, raw materials get sourced in developing countries, maybe the assembly on your products happens in China or India, and then they're shipped to you. And every step along that way emits carbon, it's bad for the environment. But, you know, what are you to do? You've got to have an iPhone, you've got to have a computer. Well, when we started out working in Kenya, you know, we were producing these biochar kilns, and we were making them in a factory, a centralized factory, shipping them out to rural areas, and it was really costly, and really carbon, it was emitting a lot of carbon. And so we thought, you know, factories are this massive point source production system. They're responsible for 18% of global CO2 emissions. What if we made the factory smaller and made it local? So we developed what we call shop in a box. So the shop in a box is a factory contained inside of a 20-foot shipping container. <coughs> it has everything that we need to make our products and a variety of other products locally, from locally available materials. It's also totally off-grid, runs off a diesel generator and a solar panel. So the shop in a box actually has what's called a CNC plasma cutter. So it's a digital fabrication tool. It allows us to quite literally email the plans for a new prototype out to our shop, and it gets produced in the field very quickly, very easily. So we actually cut all the transportation time. We don't need to get our products made in China. We don't need to get the steel made in India and shipped to China. We can make everything locally. And so we find this, this has a few impacts. It reduces carbon, obviously. It reduces cost. But in our experience in Kenya, it also makes people want the product more. People want to buy things that benefit their local community. You want to buy something when you know your friend made it. And I think this concept has applications in our lives, too. You know, we can have localized production here. There's no reason that we have to get our goods shipped from elsewhere. And I found, in this whole journey of learning how to make things, uh, you actually appreciate things a lot more when you make them. And that also means you buy fewer things. So, and uh, quality, quality does not have to suffer when you make things. These are some of our products. We can mass produce them using Shop in a Box, and they're great. So, with that, um, I hope that now when you think about climate change, you know, you don't necessarily see it as something with no solution. Uh, me, I see it, instead of a problem, I see it as an opportunity. And uh, I hope that you guys can too. Thank you.